All right. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is a live activity and live webinar, uh, Environmental Determinants of Health, Fostering Environmental Health Programs in Public Housing Primary Care. Again, my name is Jose Leon. I am with the National Center for Health in Public Housing. Uh, next slide, please. At this moment, uh, we have some housekeeping items. All participants are muted. Uh, if you have any questions, you can use the chat box and, and type your question. If you would like to ask your question uh, verbally, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, you can use the uh, icon uh, that is at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and the slides and the recording will be sent to you after the webinar. You can also go to our to our uh, website www.nchph.org where you can find the slides and all the uh, information and, and resources that we have for this activity. Next slide. Uh, this is our agenda. Uh, we have, have a very brief introduction. Uh, uh, to the NCSPH program, then um, we are going to have uh, just a very brief overview of the public housing primary care grantees. Then we are going to hear from uh, La Maestra Community Health Centers and the Office of Environmental Justice. Um, then we are going to have a Q&A session. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please uh, make sure that you um, uh, either again use the chat box or you can uh, also use the raise hand icon and your line will be unmuted. Next slide, please. The National Center for Health and Public Housing provides training and technical assistance to health centers uh, that are closed or immediately accessible to public housing. Uh, even though we work with 385 health centers uh, that are close to public housing uh, development. All the uh, training and technical assistance activities are for the more than uh, 1,400 uh, community health centers across the nation. Next slide, please. According to HERSA, and this is the most recent data uh, provided by health centers, uh, 2021 data, there are uh, over 1,300 uh, qualified, uh, federal qualified health centers providing uh, who provided services to more than 30 million patients. 458 of these uh, health, uh, uh, these uh, community health centers are located in or immediately accessible to public housing, and they provided services to over 5 million patients. And 108 uh, public housing primary care are primary care grantees, and they provided services to over 900,000 patients. Next slide, please. Just a quick uh, introduction on the demographics of those living in public housing. Uh, there are over 1.1 million residents living in public housing. 38% of the households report to have at least one person with a disability. 52% are white, 91% are um, low income and under the uh, poverty line, 43% of the household uh, are African-American, 26% are Latino, 19% uh, uh, are over the age of 65, 36% of those living in poor housing are children under the age of 17, and 32% of the uh, public uh, housing and developments report to have a, uh, a female head household with children. Next slide, please. In public housing, uh, uh, this is an excellent study from HUD and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, re in regards to uh, those receiving uh, assistance from HUD and all the condition, chronic medical condition affecting uh, these populations, um, I would like to mention, uh, for instance, that uh, in public housing, we have over 33% of people who currently smoke. And uh, that for this uh, particular uh, webinar, uh, I would like to focus on two conditions. And if you can see, uh, those uh, receiving assistance from HUD are more likely to have uh, COPD and asthma. And uh, 
uh, Zara will be just providing additional information on how they reach out to uh, patients with asthma in, in San Diego. Next slide, please. Learning objectives for this webinar, discuss the importance of assessing environmental health hazards uh, in low-income communities, review programs to lessen the impact of environmental triggers in people uh, with uh, chronic medical conditions and other resp respiratory conditions, and explore EJ screen, a new environmental justice mapping and a screen tool based on data that combines environmental and demographic indicators in maps and reports. Next slide, please. So it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, speakers for today's uh, webinar. First, uh, we are going to be listening from uh, Zara Marcellian. And then uh, we are going to hear from Matthew. Uh, Zara, is, Zara Marcellian is the founder, president, and CEO of La Maestra Family Clinic, an FKOC that serves approximately 45,000 individuals annually in San Diego County, California. Zara is an award-winning author, a well-regarded speaker, and an international consultant. Zara also serves on numerous advisory boards um, for more than 36 years, Zara has developed programs and services that meet the community's needs. Zara developed a holistic solutions-based model to address overall health and well-being for all patients, regardless of their ability to pay. The model, known as La Maestro Circle of Care, provides primary and specialty healthcare and social services to address the social determinants of health. Services include an on-site food pantry, housing, microcredit and micro enterprise programs, job training programs, after school and summer programs, outreach, health education, environmental health, case management, and public program application assistance. Then uh, uh, we are going to have Math, uh, uh, Matthew Lee, who is environmental protection specialist in, in the Office of Environmental Justice at US EPA, where he co-leads EJ Screen. Matthew spent his first 13 years at EPA in Region 3 and has dedicated his entire career to mapping for environmental justice. Matthew has a Master of Environmental Studies degree from the University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Delaware. Matthew will also be serving as a lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania this upcoming fall, where he will be teaching a course on the principle of mapping for environmental justice. So Zara, good afternoon or good morning to you. Yeah, good morning from the West Coast. Thank you so much for having, having me um, and giving me the opportunity to share some of the environmental challenges and the respective programs that La Maestra has developed throughout the years um, to help members of our community deal with um, these environmental issues. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So La Maestra started in 1986, um, and uh, you know, since well, 36 years now, we've developed numerous programs uh, that all have to do with integrating services from a primary care medical home and integrating social determinants services uh, as well to achieve health and well being. A trip to the doctor is very important, but we know that if somebody is living in substandard housing, it's going to impact their life a lot. So um, this is our circle of care. It's a holistic model. Uh, we still are a very grassroots organization, very responsive to the needs of our populations. Next slide, please. Uh, all of these are the services under the circle of care, and you can see, um, you know, as, as we've grown, the needs, uh, you know, have emerged from the populations, uh, the subsectors of the populations, and of course, addressing the environment with, you know, where these people live. So these are the services that we've developed. Next slide. The framework um, that really fits our discussion today uh, looks at how the environment affects patients uh, and residents of a neighborhood at multiple levels. We'll start with the environment. So next slide, please. 
So these are some of the adverse um, environmental factors in San Diego. So we're looking at the overall picture here. You know, we have excessive heat. In fact, we're still in a heat wave now, um, resulting in fires because of the droughts, uh, pollution in San Diego, water shortage, high utility fees, and then issues created um, across the border. Um, we have a lot of pollution, sewage spills. All of these are like constant environmental challenges for our communities. Some of the programs that La Maestra has developed to uh, address these are we do a lot of outreach um, in what now it's 40 some languages uh, that our population speak. Um, we provide health education. We offer resources and pathways to people um, to draw down what they need um, in terms of information, how to connect to programs. Uh, we belong to coalitions that do a lot of advocacy on a local, statewide, and federal level. We're very much involved with emergency preparedness. Uh, we have partnerships with California the State of California Office of Emergency Services, the county, um, and we're designated as a point of dispensing, which means that you know where large numbers of people are gathered um, and there's a disaster, we can receive medications, vaccine supplies during an emergency. Next slide. And um, <clears throat> La Maestra's com commitment to environmental justice. When we, uh, you know, for years we were in very old buildings uh, in the inner city of San Diego, built for like 1920s, constantly having to redevelop them. Finally, we were able to build our own, you know, uh, 36,440 square foot building, and we decided to to try and achieve a gold lead certified health center, which we did. And we informed ourselves about, okay, so what, what, is, what difference does that make for our patients? And um, we're able to you know, make some really uh, wonderful, I think, uh, changes there in our you know, low distressed areas that we've been in with our sites, you know, because we're there where the populations reside. And every time we have opportunity to redevelop um, current sites or expand, we try to incorporate as many of these lead points as possible to bring a healthier environment for the patients to enter and for our staff to work in. We also initiated recycling programs, light bulb exchanges. Uh, we work with the local San Diego Gas and Electric Company, utility companies to make sure that our populations have access to discount programs like seniors, those with chronic diseases. We also initiate canyon and street cleanup programs, working to, to you know, bring more greenery into the area. Everything is concrete, um, not a lot of uh, place for people to uh, enjoy uh, nature in the inner city. So we try to bring in um, you know, like community gardens, and uh, work with the, the local businesses to try to beautify and you know, bring something green to the area. We also have our uh, La Maestra housings, transitional housing programs, and around each one of those is a community garden as well. And the advocacy and collaborative networks that we belong to um, really, I think, are focusing more now on how the environment affects the health and well being of the patients. Uh, aside from, you know, like working also with our local law enforcement, you know, around crime and um, the fact that there's not enough uh, safe areas for our kids to play. That's just another big, um, big issue. Next slide, please. So now we um, can zoom in here a little bit to how the environment can adversely affect somebody in the home environment. We have a uh, lack of housing in San Diego, uh, lack of low income housing. A waiting list for section eight is about 11 years right now. So <clears throat> we work with the supportive housing uh, department and the federal and state subsidized affordable housing uh, 
and the landlords. So uh, that's that's proven to be a little tricky, and um, you know because the the units are very overcrowded. Uh, the conditions of those older units have sometimes you know the lead paint, asbestos ceilings, poor air ventilation, lack of AC, old carpeting, um, a lot of pests, trash, plumbing, mold. And, um, and how to, you know, really connect with the landlords, the property managers in a way that uh, encourages them to address some of these issues has been, uh, uh, I would say, it's a continuing lesson. And sometimes we're successful, but we try different ways. And that's what I wanted to share with you also today. Many tenants are fearful of contacting the landlords about anything because the minute they contact them right away, there's a rent increase. So part of our, um, I think our, you know, programs, uh, the, the focus is on helping the tenants negotiate with the landlords about repairs, about upgrades, uh, addressing some of these issues that definitely affect their health, which we'll see in the next slide. Um, and we do have housing net navigators, we have uh, a legal uh, assistance department, and we collaborate with um, attorneys that address tenants' rights and through these legal partnerships. Next slide, please. So how, you know, how does one's living environment affect negatively the health and well-being? Well, <clears throat> We have patients, obviously, with chronic disease, and these, uh, you know, the the effects of their their illness is made worse by living in an area with, you know, like not, let's say, the refrigerator doesn't work well, um, and so you know, where are they going to store their insulin if they're diabetic? Um, we have worked with the managed care plans who will bring in. Uh, for free, the small refrigerators specifically for the patient medications. Um, also, uh, the asthma, the kids with asthma, you know, living in environments with carpets that are 20 years old or the there's a real uh, lack of good quality air. I mean, even open windows, maybe they've been painted shut. Also, you know, for the crime, um, issue in, in our areas. So what, what we'll do is our, let's say our pediatricians will write letters to the landlords and say, you know, um, so-and-so is, is under our care. They've been treated for, you know, asthma. And um, it seems that, you know, in doing the home assessment, which we do, uh, especially through our asthma remediation uh, grant that we received, part of the uh, objectives of that grant is for us to go in and do a home assessment. We also do this with our seniors. And, uh, um, and then, you know, we go from there to see, you know, what issues are existing in the home that could be corrected, repaired, replaced, and then trying to bring down those, uh, tap into those resources to make it happen. And it's amazing, you know, sometimes when landlords get letters from the providers, it really does seem to work. We'll get responses, maybe um, and maybe they won't replace the carpet with, you know, wood floors or the, you know, the, like, what is it, the vinyl floors, but they'll put a new carpet, okay, at least it's something better, or they'll fix the ventilation, they'll open those windows. Uh, when they're repainting some of these older uh, buildings and redeveloping them, then we also uh, intercede and talk about, you know, the lead in the paint and, and you know, how to remove that and like what, what's their plan um, of addressing that as a, asbestos as well, the ceilings, popcorn ceilings. So as much as we can, you know, we try to maintain a good relationship with these landlords, our property managers, <clears throat> and also working through the city's, uh, you know, the housing commission and so forth, and making sure that we can distribute our outreach materials, that we can go to the 
sites themselves and offer help education. And it, it's, it's, it's incredible, uh, some of the repairs that have been able to, you know, to happen for our patients. Next slide. Uh, so like as Jose mentioned, we have about uh, 45,000 in duplicated patients representing 245,000 visits per year. This is 30 languages, we're now up to 44. Um, we are a resettlement agency as well for refugees and immigrants. So we have you know, on our staff, very culturally diverse um, you know, staff members to help the patients that are equally as diverse. Next slide. So that's um, the information I wanted to share with you on our programs, specifically around environmental justice. And uh, any questions, please let me know about this or our circle of care. I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. And I'd like to introduce Matthew Lee, the environmental protection specialist. Thanks, Zara. Great overview of La Maestra's work. Um, you know, and I think it really, uh, the overview of EJ screen that I will provide will dovetail nicely um, to some of the work you just presented, you know, about how to maybe direct some of your, um, you know, your health interventions uh, geographically. So let me pull up our, our presentation here. Here we go. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm Matthew Lee. I'm in the Office of Environmental Justice at EPA, um, and I'm going to present EJ Screen, uh, which is EPA's web-based GIS tool for nationally consistent EJ screening and mapping. Um, and the keywords there are nationally consistent. Uh, we have coverage for the entire country, um, including Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, um, and actually in our update coming in a couple of weeks uh, for some of the other US territories. Uh, and what EJ Screen does um, that kind of sets it apart from some of your other GIS tools that are out there is that EJ Screen is combining environmental and demographic data to highlight areas where vulnerable populations may be disproportionately impacted by pollution. You know, and as we've kind of discussed, and as all of you know, this gets at the crux of environmental justice, right? Your vulnerable populations, your poor communities of color, linguistically isolated populations, you know, communities on tribal lands who we know face higher pollution burdens. Um, and those are the exact type of communities, you know, that a tool like EJ Screen uh, strives to highlight. Now, equally important to understanding what EJ Screen is, is understanding what EJ Screen is not. Um, screen is in the name. This is a screening tool, right? It doesn't cover every single environmental or EJ issue, right? And, and that national coverage, that national consistency that I just talked about, that is a limitation in and of itself, right? We are limited to the data sets for which there is national coverage. Right, and we simply don't have, you know, data on every single traditional EJ issue, you know, like drinking water, like confined animal feeding operations, pesticide use, things like that. Um, you know, so again, we are limited to the data sets for which there is national coverage, um, which isn't every single EJ issue. Now, I'm not going to spend a ton more time on these limitations. Most of these limitations are inherent to any screening tool, not just EJ screen. Um, but if you do come away with nothing else uh, from my presentation about EJ screen, recognize that EJ screen is not a labeling tool, right? EJ screen does not label communities EJ communities or not EJ communities. Um, and that is an inherent difference, and I'll talk about this in a couple slides between EJ Screen and some of the other screening tools that are out there, like the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, you know, which is a, a, a labeling tool. But EJ Screen is is not a labeling tool. It is simply highlighting areas um, that have vote, both vulnerable populations facing higher pollution burdens. 
And we primarily do that through the formation of EJ indices. Again, those are a combination of that single environmental indicator of which we have 12. Um, so it's taking a single environmental indicator and combining that with demographic data um, to form these EJ indices. You can also look at the environmental indicators in EJ screen on their own. You can look at the socioeconomic indicators in EJ screen on their own. Um, and then new for this past update, we have added in a couple indicators on health, uh, which I'll talk about. We have enhanced our climate indicators and we've uh, rounded out the tool with information on critical service gaps. Um, EJ screen is by no means a static tool. Uh, we do update the tool annually, and this year we're actually updating the tool twice. Um, so we updated the tool in February, and we are about to update the tool uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, could be as soon as next Thursday, fingers crossed, we shall see. Um, but again, you know, this is this is a constantly evolving tool um, utilizing the most recent data that is available. So we are annually updating our environmental data sets. We annually update our um, demographics, which we pull from the Census Bureau's American Community Survey. Those are five year rolling averages of demographic data. So right now in the tool, you're seeing 2015 to 2019 ACS data. And when we update, uh, when we release the update in next month, let's say, um, we will have 2016 to 2020 ACS data. All of the data within EJ screen is available at the block group level. Uh, this is the, the most refined unit for which the Census Bureau releases detailed demographics. Um, and in the name of transparency, everything within EJ screen, those environmental indicators, the socioeconomic indicators, the EJ indices themselves, are all available for download. Um, so if you are your own GIS person or work with the GIS team, you know, and the web app uh, doesn't necessarily fit your needs, you can download all the information in EJ screen and utilize it within your own GIS. However, you do not need any special GIS software, any special passwords, any, anything besides internet access to access EJ screen. And we at EPA and all of our stakeholder partners utilize the same exact tool with the same exact data. Um, as I mentioned, we did just update the tool in February. Uh, we we rebranded the tool as EJ Screen 2.0 because we uh, updated the user interface for make, to make for a much more user friendly experience. Um, we did update again all those uh, demographic and environmental indicators, including transitioning um, to EPA's Air Tox Screens data sets, uh, which incorporate uh, ethylene oxide. Um, we also added a 12th EJ index on underground storage tanks. We enhanced our socioeconomic indicators to include information on unemployment. Um, we added wildfire hazard potential and drought to our climate indicators. Um, of obvious interest to this group, we have added health data into EJ screen for the first time. Um, so thanks to CDC Places in partnership with Robert Wood Johnson, we have census track level. This is the most refined that it gets, the most refined geography uh, that it gets for health data. So track level data for low life expectancy, heart disease, and asthma. Again, national coverage for those data sets. Um, and then recognizing, you know, that there are much more than environmental and health burdens that affect communities, uh, we have built in information on critical service gaps into the tool. So we also, for the first time uh, ever, have information on food deserts, medically underserved areas, and broadband service. Um, depending on your use of the tool, uh, there are a variety of different ways to view the data within EJ screen. Um, if you're looking at, you know, an entire city like 
city of San Diego, let's say, and you want to, you know, identify hotspots within the city, you know, looking at the maps uh, on the web app and toggling on and off the indicators one at a time is a great way, again, to take a larger geography and um, kind of hone in on more specific areas. And then once you've kind of honed in on those specific areas, that might be, you know, a block group or a radi a one mile radius um, that you would like to run a or generate a standard printable report on. Um, and I'll show you how to do both of these things in uh, the live demo, because I think we'll definitely have time. Um, I did want to take a moment here uh, that, you know, that's a very brief overview of EJ screen. We do have some some robust trainings coming up here in uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, but I do want to take a, a moment and talk about some of the other federal level screening tools that are out there, um, because while this is a great place to be that we now have multiple multiple federal level tools, um, it is a bit confusing. I understand for for you know our stakeholders outside of of the government. Um, so there are now uh, at least three different, and there are some other uh, agencies also have their own EJ-ish uh, tools. Um, but you know, EJ Screen is EPA's tool. CGIST, which is the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, that is the tool that was released out of CEQ, the Center for Environmental Quality, um, that is associated with the Justice 40 Initiative. Um, and then just this past month, CDC released their um, environmental justice index. And I'll talk about some of the similarities and differences uh, between those tools in the next slide. Um, but just recognize that they are in fact different tools. Um, one is not replacing another. Um, they are again, different tools that have different functions and different abilities. Um, in terms of us at EPA, we are going to continue to utilize EJ Screen as kind of our primary tool um, for integrating EJ into, you know, into the very DNA of the of the agency, like our administrator likes to say. Um, but you know, these tools complement each other, right? So it's not a matter of EJ Screen versus CGIST versus the EJI, right? They they do offer different perspectives on vulnerability. Um, so again, it you know ultimately these tools are used in concert with uh, with each other. Um, and for the most part, they are all based on the same you know data sets uh, and certainly the same buckets or categories of data. Um, so they're all pretty much looking at socioeconomic, climate, uh, environmental, and health indicators. And then because of that, there's obvious, you know, extensive overlap in the areas that are that are highlighted by by all three tools. Um, but there are some some key differences. Uh, I do want to to point out, uh, obviously, without going into too much detail about the other tools, but. EJ Screen is at that block group level. Uh, again, this is the most refined geography for which the Census Bureau releases detailed demographics. You know, we feel that EJ issues are inherently local, uh, and you should be utilizing that most refined unit of geography. Um, but that being said, there are simply there are more data sets available at the census track level, right? And that's why the CGIST and the uh, the Environmental Justice Index by the CDC are utilizing track level data. Um, so there's an inherent dis difference there, just in terms of the geography. Um, the CGIST and the EJI, the Environmental Justice Index, um, they are simply providing you census track level outlooks on, on their data sets. Um, in EJ screen, you know, you can put buffers around a site, add in, you know, compare multiple block groups at a time, um, you know, really have a user defined area uh, in these other tools. You cannot do that. It is simply giving you information on that particular census track. Um, CGIST in particular does not incorporate race. Uh, into their tool, whereas EJ Screen and the EJI do. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, CGIST is a labeling tool, right? And they do the term that they utilize um, 
However unfortunate it may be, they chose to, to term uh, their communities disadvantaged communities. We like to use underserved, but nonetheless, the, the label that they're utilizing for their tool is, is disadvantaged community. Again, while you know, EJ Screen and the EJI do not label communities at all. Um, and then the EJI is, you know, that is a very different model than EJ screen. I mean, the EJI, the Environmental Justice Index, is a cumulative scoring model. So it is taking all these buckets or categories of data uh, of indicators and combining them into one single score. Uh, where EJ Screen does not do that. It combines a single environmental indicator with demographics and kind of provides a cumulative outlook across 12 different environmental indicators, but is not wrapping those indicators up into one score uh, like the EJI do. Um, so that is a, a very brief primer on both EJ Screen and then also some of the other tools that are out there. Um, we do, we at EPA do have a, again, a robust training session set for uh, October 19th. I am extremely confident that by then we will definitely have our update uh, EJ Screen 2.1 out by, by then, uh, which will uh, feature some really good enhancements to the tool. So I, I recommend looking out for that. Um, but in the meantime, let me do a quick check, perfect timing, and I am going to go show you a quick live demo of the tool. Um, as I mentioned, all you need is internet access to access EJ Screen. Um, so if you just Google EJ Screen, right, I think the homepage is the first thing that pops up, but if you click launch the tool, um, this is the tool that you're going to see, you know, released in February was EJ Screen 2.0. Um, we've housed all of the data and uh, functionality of the tool in the table of contents here, which we have split into four different tabs. Um, so first and foremost, you have your maps, all your different indicators. This is where most people go, uh, you know, primarily um, when they look at the tool. But we also have a places tab, a reports tab, and a tools tab, and I'll go through these in a second. Um, but again, you know, first and foremost, if you wanted to, you know, in, in this case, I'm going to I'm going to follow Zara's lead and, and focus on San Diego. Um, but if you just wanted to look at something very simple, like the geographic distribution of low income communities um, within San Diego, that is something that you can easily do within EJ screen. You know, and each one of these irregularly shaped polygons is a census block group. Again, this is the most refined unit for which the Census Bureau releases detailed demographics, you know, and you can again see um, the geographic distribution of where low income populations are living in and around San Diego. So you can see if, you know, just based on this information alone, if you're starting to direct, you know, health interventions or something like that, you know, in your community, it can start showing you areas, you know, where the most vulnerable populations uh, are present. Um, Again, each one of the, you can click on a, one of these block groups and get information on that particular block group directly in the tool. So it's telling you 72% of this particular block group is, is low income. Um, and you, know, you can see the rest of, of the breakdown of the other demographics. Um, you know, there's a ton of different layers that are available uh, for you to kind of explore here. I will take a second and, and focus on some of the, the health disparities data that we have in the tool. Um, I'm going to remove the low income. You know, we can, we can add in the areas of, of, of higher asthma prevalence uh, in the area. Now, again, this is comparing the areas, the block groups in San Diego to the rest of the country, right? So this is a different, pers this is a national perspective on asthma. Um, but again, you can still see some of the areas that are in the 80th to 90th percentile for, for asthma prevalence, meaning that less than 10% of the rest of the country has more asthma uh, prevalence than in these particular block groups. So again, in terms of directing health interventions, maybe associated with asthma reduction, right, these might be areas that you then hone in on, you know, um, to get some of your most bang for your buck in terms of identifying vulnerable populations. 
Um, another thing, you know, we, we built into the tool is um, some of these climate indicators, obviously somewhat associated with asthma, at least exacerbation of asthma um, would be wildfire hazards. Um, we do have that built into the tool. And actually in the next update, we have an even better layer, in my opinion, on wildfire uh, potential. Um, but you can see the areas, you know, that would be most affected uh, by wildfire. Um, and again, this is all starting to hone in on different geographies uh, where these interventions might be needed the most. Um, one of the, the really nice things you can do about the tool, again, is see um, not only all those environmental and demographic indicators, but you know, it is the tool is its own GIS library. You can start seeing the different EPA regulated facilities you know, in the area. Um, these are the different TRI sites. You know, you can see the name. Each one of these is hyperlinked, so you can actually go and see the pollutants that this particular facility is um, is emitting. Another nice thing that we have built into this uh, this tool of obviously of relevance to this particular group um, is information on uh, public housing. So you can see we have. I'm going to zoom out here. We have the public housing. Um, sites, you know, in EJ screen, these are just points on a map, uh, but nonetheless, you can actually see these particular sites, you know, public housing uh, locations. And one of the nice things you can do about EJ screen is now that you've kind of identified um, these public housing areas, you know, you might want to see, you know, is, it's not, uh, is, linguistic isolation, you know, an issue in and around this particular area, you know, and this is showing you, you know, the area obviously has has higher prevalence of linguistically isolated populations. One of the really nice things you can do with EJ screen is kind of now again that you've identified this particular block group that may be of interest to you. This might be a block group or an area that you run an EJ screen report on. Um, so you can select the block group. In this case, we can just click on this block group. It's going to um, it's going to highlight that block group in a second. You can see it's highlighting this particular block group, and there's a couple of uh, options of how to access the information. You can explore the reports. This is going to give you information on those, you know, EJ indices. Again, that combination of environmental and demographic data. Um, you can print that standard three-page printable report. Or what's really nice is you can actually generate an ACS, an American Community Survey report. Um, and this is of relevance to, to linguistic isolation because, and I have this preloaded, it does take about 20 seconds to, to load, which seems like an eternity in a, in a, in a presentation. But if you clicked on this ACS report, um, it's going to bring up a nice, again, three-page PDF uh, pertaining to this particular block group that we selected. You can see that particular block group is 95% people of color. Um, but what I really like about this particular report, it's giving you a breakdown by race. Um, so you can see 85% of this particular block group is, is reporting as Hispanic. And what's even more informative than that is a, on the second page of the report, it's actually giving you a breakdown of the linguistically isolated households. And in this case, you can see 100% of those linguistically isolated households uh, in that particular block group are speaking Spanish. Um, so that obviously helps inform you know, community outreach, meaningful engagement, uh, things like that. Um, so those are just some of the features of the tool, uh, yeah, of the tool itself. Real quickly, I will highlight uh, the tools tab. Um, you can, you know, we recognize that this, that the, especially these indicators, um, while they do provide a nice cumulative outlook on some of the burdens that a community may be facing, they're by no means everything, right? So we do allow the user to bring in their own data into EJ screen. Um, so, you know, I'm right outside of Philadelphia, you know, Philadelphia has really great children's blood lead levels at the census track level, right? You could actually bring that data 
into EJ screen, right? Because those aren't nationally national uh, data sets. But if you do have local data, you know whether that's in a shapefile format um, um, as a map service, you could bring that into EJ screen. Um, EJ screen is linked to the geo platform, so there's been a lot of interest and, and intrigue, you know, in um, you know, historical or systemic racism and the negative environmental legacy that that has left behind, you know, via redlining, you can bring in the old redlining maps into EJ screen, you know, and see areas, you know, where dis historic disinvestment may have led to, you know, present day um, stressors and things like that. Uh, so again, you know, you're not just limited to the data sets that are available here. You can bring in your own data, uh, which is a really powerful element of EJ screen. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I certainly wanted to leave time for questions, um, but hopefully you all enjoyed that and, and see how you could potentially integrate uh, its use into your own projects. Thank you, Zara. Thank you, Matt, for uh, your presentations. Really, really interesting uh, to see from both uh, uh, sides, you know, the community side, the federal side, and what you are doing to, uh, to address environmental health. So if you have any questions for uh, Zara or Matthew, again, um, please uh, type your question in the either the chat box or you, your line can also be unmuted if you would like to ask your question verbally. In the meantime, um, Zara, a uh, question uh, for you. Uh, there is a lot, you know, that community health centers are doing to address social determinants of health. And uh, these pieces, uh, uh, environmental determinants of health, basically, you know, and um, uh, it's been it's been uh, a priority for all health centers and for HHS and HRSA in particular, you know, to help uh, the uh, special and vulnerable populations, you know, uh, uh, to help them, you know, with all these social determinants of health. Um, and Zara, in addition to what La Maestra is doing, you know, to address environmental health uh, in particular, uh, are, is there any collaboration with other organizations in the community? Uh, any uh, thing that you are doing with uh, either the local Department of Health or the uh, public housing agencies or faith-based organizations to make sure people, you know, understand the link uh, between the environment and their health. Oh, thank you, Jose. I think that there are not enough resources available yet. So what we do is, you know, since there's no specific designated nonprofit that's just focused on environmental justice in our area, we then partner with companies, vendors, landlords, housing, whatever, to see how we can build that collaboration to address those issues. And some of those that I mentioned were with our local utilities company, others could be with the housing uh, projects uh, or you know, the affordable housing. Uh, and then you have to go by sector. So just like our circle of care, the integrated model, you have how many sec service sectors integrating, whether it's food, housing, um, you know, health, and on and on, you have to look for those uh, companies, agencies, nonprofits, CBOs that are in each sector that are sensitive, sensitized to the issue of how you know negative, adverse environmental health factors uh, really uh, you know mess with people's health, and and how can we address that? And and of course, it's tied to social justice because. You know where where are where are these conditions most prevalent in our areas? You know, uh, so it's um, it's it's all part and parcel. I wanted to also say, um, Matt, you know, Matt and I presented at the last NAC conference, and after that, uh, me and some of our staff reached out to Matt and went through the training on this EJ tool, and it has been fantastic. So as a um, a witness here from the health center uh, group, 
I can tell you, you know, looking up statistics, looking up demographics, looking up, you know, where the local pollutants are, looking up the, you know, how does that affect and contribute to the chronic diseases and the numbers that we see has helped us with reporting, grants, and so forth. And, um, and, and just, you know, really uh, informing ourselves uh, to, again, keep, keep a pulse on what's happening in, our, in the communities that we serve. So thank you so much, Matt. This is, this is an incredible tool. Thank you, Zara. Um, I don't see, well, let's see. There is a question. Um, Would you like for me to read it? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, regarding social determinants of health, sharing this resource, the Social Determinants of Health Information Exchange Learning Forum from the HHS Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. Um, this is basically a resource that is being shared by one of our attendees. Um, and it says that recordings are available on implementation of SDOH information exchange in communities, including to provide referrals to entities that provide services to address health, housing, utilities, food needs, and more. And the link is provided here in the chat. Wonderful. Thank you, Whitney. Um, and thank you, uh, Fide. Um, I believe the question is, uh, in this case for Matt. Um, Matt, uh, you know uh, you know what health centers are doing, Zara, just briefly explain to us, you know, how they are helping to address all these environmental health issues and, and, and the environmental justice, you know, to make sure that everybody uh, is uh, aware of the issue, you know, specifically the staff working uh, at the community health center level. So what are the, uh, I mean, and, and Zara can also chime in on this, but what, you know, I mean, this is a great tool for uh, all, uh, all uh, community-based organizations. And how do you think health centers, you know, can use this information to, to help their patients? You know, I mean, it, it's, it's a great resource. It provides a lot of information, you know, on, on all these um, um, health issues. You know, uh, what is, how, how they can incorporate this information, you know, uh, either to develop a, a prevention program or, or or to reach out to communities. I saw that you have the locations of public housing developments, you know, and, and so what, 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 what uh, how do you think they can use this, you know, and incorporate this into your daily practice? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the really nice things about the tool is that it gets the data into the hands of the people, right, which is, you know, until relatively recently, this data was not accessible, right, and now we have these, these tools that, you know, really enhance data equity, um, and again, make get this data into uh, into the hands of the people on the ground. Um, and in terms of both for the practitioners and the patients, I think, you know, understanding some of, of the different stressors that are that are around the community, like even and I didn't spend too much time focusing on the other EPA regulated facilities, but seeing the different facilities, you know, that are in your area that may be contributing to, to the exacerbation of, of the symptoms, you know, understanding the chemicals that, you know, that they're emitting. Again, this is available within, a, you know, a couple clicks of the mouse now. Um, so you don't have to spend, you know, hours of time that, you know, neither the practitioner nor the patient has time for, right? This is available right at, at your fingertips. Um, so ultimately, I think it depends on, on the use, um, but I just think that, that this data is, is finally available for everybody. Um, and again, just seeing some of the other stressors that uh, could be potentially contributing um, to some of these, you know, ailments uh, is very powerful. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Fide, we'll, uh, we have a comment as well. Can you please read it to our panelists? Sure. Um, this is a comment from Miley Munoz, and she's saying great resource. She will be sharing, sharing this information with for their FQHC annual reporting. Thank you, uh, Fide. Uh, and Zara, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned that your, your staff took the uh, training, you know, and, and uh, 
Matt uh, briefly explained to us, you know, how health centers can use these uh, uh, tools as well. So how is uh, how La, is La Maestra using this tool? You know, has used this tool, you know, and, and, and what have you been able to do for your population? Well, uh, we've been able to, for example, uh, share this with some of our partners, you know, like La Maestra has uh, clinic sites in the schools, local schools. And, uh, and as we're developing the plans moving forward, more outreach, more education for the community, um, that's, that's been a, a great resource to share is, you know, look, look at this tool, look at, you know, what information we can uh, call from it and to address some of these, these issues like uh, the prevalence of asthma, for example, in our asthma mediation program. So that's, uh, that's an example, working with uh, other sectors as well, just to build that awareness and again, many do not know that this resource is available. Thank you, Zara. And, and Matt, a, a quick question. How often is the data updated? I'm sorry if you said that and I probably missed it, but I, is, I mean, how, how often you go back, you know, and re review data, you know, and, uh, and update any data that you have or they are using? So we update the tool on an annual basis. Um, and in fact, this, this year we're updating it twice um, because there was a delay in the release of the census data due to the pandemic. Um, we didn't get the 2016, 2020 um, data into that February update. Um, so now we're doing a, an October update to get that 2016 to 2020 uh, demographic data into the tool. Um, so you can start seeing, you know, tracking change over time and looking at each year's uh, or each year five year rolling average um, of, of the data. And that's just for the, the demographics. We also are updating the environmental data sets. Um, almost all of those get updated annually. There is a couple of the data sets or there are a couple of the data sets um, associated with air that are updated less frequently. Um, but just know the tool is always utilizing the most recent data uh, available. It's by no means real time, right? We haven't gotten there yet. Um, but, you know, we just smashed a rocket into a comet. You know, I think we can do anything these days. Um, so maybe we'll have a real time tool in a, in a couple of years. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Um, we're almost at the top of the hour, and I don't see any additional questions. I want to be very respectful of your time. Uh, so uh, if you have any question, uh, any additional questions, please make sure that you send our questions to uh, any of the NCHPH staff members. Uh, and we will be glad to just uh, send your questions to Zara and Matt and uh, to get their responses. Uh, also, please do not forget to complete the post evaluation survey. Um, the, your information is very helpful to to see how we can improve, you know, uh, our webinars and activities or to select new topics that you are interested in. Uh, next slide, please. So we have uh, any additional information uh, in regards to uh, resources also uh, being done by the National uh, Center for Community, uh, National Center for Health and Public Housing. So uh, uh, this uh, one in particular is coming soon. Um, we are we have been also working, you know, and uh, trying to identify the location of the community health centers and the public housing development. So you can make sure you know how that you get in contact with your uh, uh, special or, or vulnerable populations in your community. Next slide. And again, uh, please visit our website. You have uh, all the information about all the, our resources. And uh, the next slide, uh, you can also join our uh, communication channels and uh, information about uh, everything that is related to or interesting for community health centers. Next slide. And this is our contact information. If you have any additional questions, please, uh, you can send it to me, Jose Leon, or uh, our health research analyst, Pire Pineda Sandoval. And uh, I, again, I would like to thank Zara and Matt for their presentations. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a great uh, webinar and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Thank Thanks, you. Jose. Thanks, Zara.
Thanks, Matt.